years at the SMI that I met years ago in, in, in Cape Town, in Johannesburg, and then we have close relationship for so long. And Pierre Chériot, who was the French guy from here, but I'm also the Francophone guy, so, so the relationship between languages and, and, and country and, and relationship, cultural relationship, are facilitated by people like, like uh, Pierre Chériot here. So I salute those friends and those ancestors, and it goes what my grandma saying, you know, we are not the only one on Earth. So I will thank you and I will salute you. Uh, coming to uh, uh, Walter Benjamin is not really different, you know, because when I wrote this novel uh, uh, on Djibouti that is called uh, Passage of Tears, I was elaborating on the new, uh, let's say, geopolitical tension in Djibouti, because we were at the time of, you know, uh, after the war on terror and so on and so on, Djibouti is a military outpaced by the Western powers. So J Djibouti was coming some kind of, you know, a place where I can where some uh, creative mind or a writer can elaborate what we call novels and thrillers. So I was just saying, I will do a thriller. And then I just say, yeah, okay, that is not enough. I also have to do what I often do, and what I often do is to build links, you know, to create links that are, some are visible and some are not visible. And for me, uh, Walter Benjamin was a kind of great uncle, and he was missing, you know. I, I, I have been, uh, I have the luck to live a year long in, Berlin as a, as, a, as a writer in residence. And when most of the people were attracted by the new Berlin, Potsdamer Platz and you know, the, the frenzy life in, uh, in uh, Petrauberg, I was, I was attracted to the, the old Berlin, the, the Berlin of the 30s, 1930s, and the Berlin of the minds who were missing. And I just thought that Walter Benjamin was a kind of great uncle to us though he was German, though he was Jewish, though he was from the 30s. Uh, and, because w w and one of the reasons is that he was the figure of the exile and the figure of the wandering, uh, wander, wandering mind and wandering Jew. And I say, when we have now what we call now African immigrants, well, Walter Benjamin would have adopted one of them and he would have, you know, create this kind of relationship because the wandering minds of, of previous year Previous time were maybe Walter Benjamin's, and now we have African immigrants. And so my point was actually to take back Walter Benjamin and to bring here and to say he belonged to us also. Fantastic. Um, Leila, in your book, uh, what, what Salma does is, um, well, Salma is actually the one who's really, really invested in that particular journey. And the other two women come along, um, you know, as uh, one is quite hesitant, obviously. Um, but the other one is also, you know, Iman is thinking, okay, to leave my child. And then Moni is there because Moni is there. And uh, I, wanted, I, wanted, I wanted you to talk about this where I remember texting you while I was reading and I said, I feel like pulling Salma from the pages and slapping her. Yes, you know? <laughs> because she was so overbearing and so... You know, so so overbearing in certain ways, and 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 I wanted I wanted us, but 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 also the three women that are, that were very identifiable and 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 they were beautiful in that way, and I'd like us to talk about those three women and the friendships and and I think often uh, the desires, um, in particular with 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 um, Salma, the desires, the assumption that oh if you if you are married and you've got this and you've got that, then you must be happy. And yet, happiness is such an elusive thing. I, I'd like you to talk about that. Yeah, so Salma, in a way, is, is the leader of the group because she's, uh, she's, uh, she's more, the most successful. She's married to a Scottish man. She's got children. She has a successful job as a massage uh, therapist. And the others look up to her in, uh, to some extent as, as she's more settled in Britain. Um, but what has happened to her is that recently her old boyfriend from Cairo has got in touch with her through Facebook and they've been going back and forth and so she's starting to, th to, to think of, uh, of her life in Egypt and how it was to be. And of course the first uh, time he contacted her, he addressed her as you do in Egypt as Dr. Salma because they had graduated from medical school together in Cairo, but she's no longer a doctor because her, her degree is not, um, her qualifications are not accepted in Britain and she wasn't able to pass the exams. So she's been forced to be 
a massage therapist. So just by him saying to her, doctor, it brought back all the old ambitions and all the old feelings that are associated with, with home. And so uh, she begins this relationship with him. And uh, because the relationship is long distance, she feels safe. She convinces herself that there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. So um, that is the, the, her specific uh, story. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and, and talking about the characters, I would like to talk about uh, the twins, uh, Jib and his brother, and how their parts take such immense um, different passages, but um, I, I would like to talk about it in a, in a context of, of history in particular, because what you do is you mention even a younger Jib with a best friend who was Jewish, David, and, um, and, 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 and then their, their, their parts, even with religion, with everything, take such different passages. Can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, but yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, but the Jewish child is just, you know, a minor figure, and it's uh, linked to the uh, uh, the Yemen uh, Jewish minority that were no longer in existence in Yemen. Uh, they go back to Israel in, in the in, in, in the 1948. But basically, the novel, let's say three quarters of the novel, is focused on uh, the dilemma between two brothers. Uh, we have seen. I often time when I'm bragging, I say I would have written that book later. It, if it came later, maybe it will, it will be more received because we have seen in many cases of those, you know, uh, terrorists where you have also brotherhood in, in shape. For example, in the case of France, we have those uh, two brothers called Kwashi, the brothers Kwashi. In the Boston bombing, we also have two brothers. But let's say my, the novel was previous uh, and came out in 2009, and we have two brothers, Jamal and Jibril. And Jamal, for somehow, made it and went to Canada, uh, Quebec, and became a kind of Canadian slash Djiboutian. And he was uh, coming back to uh, make a kind of memo for some uh, industrial petrol company. And at the same time, he will go back to Djibouti for a week. And he will not meet, but he will be. Uh, threatened by his brother who is in prison, and his brother, he became a kind of what we call now terrorist. And of course, Islamophobia has to do with that labeling terrorist. And he's in a pre high security prison. And I have actually taken inspiration from, not G because Djibouti, we don't have really those kind of issues, but I have taken advantage, if you will, of the Shabab in Somalia, in Mogadishu. And so I just, it was really something that could happen in Djibouti. And of course, we also know here in, 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 uh, in northern China, Nigeria, so we have those issues. So basically, the two brothers, uh, what was interesting for me as a writer is that the hiding brother, the absent brother, is the more menacing yeah. and the more fruitful. And it was really, for me, a, a way of also making, uh, 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 how do you say, embracing fiction as a way of you know creating conversation because uh, the brother who is missing will, manage, will, will trade his brother, and they will have a discussion on how two brothers have been separate and because of the context of the Djibouti situation and so on and so forth. So, but I wanted to dramatize that uh, 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 brotherhood, that problematic brotherhood, and also to talk about how uh, Islam has been derailed, derailed and used for political reasons in, 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 in Somalia and in Djibouti as a way. Um. Yes, and, and then there is, there is that moment where there is the questioning on, on, on faith. Even on Jamal's part, who is the more, who is the extreme, the, um, you know, political and stuff and everything. And, and he does that questioning. So I, I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed how you pursued that and questioned religion. But you, you also did that with, um, with the three women, where they're going and, uh, okay, what, what constitutes a sin? And, 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 um, and, and so when you do that, I would, I would like you to talk about that as well. In, in addition, particularly with, um, what's her name? With, um, with Iman, you know? When she is, the frustration that she faces, uh, and the way that she essentially uses a child as a crutch. Yeah, actually, uh, I was going to read this part. Okay. Okay. Shall I do that? Yeah. Yes. 
Okay, so this is the character of uh, uh, Moni, actually, and she um, her she has a son who's disabled. So this is uh, she has a five-year-old son who's disabled, and she's never uh, been uh, separated from him. So this is the first time for her to leave her son and to go anywhere, and she found it very difficult to leave him in, um, in this nursing home. And one of the things that Selma, the, who was very bossy, is that she was saying to her, you need a holiday, you need to have a break, and you have the, the, um, the facilities uh, are there for, uh, you know, for you to, to take a break from your son, because this is, the health services do that in, in, in Scotland, which is a very good thing that they do, because... Uh, Okay, so her son's name is Adam. Adam had not understood that she was leaving him, and she was grateful for that. She now wondered if he cared that he was the only black child, if he even noticed. Sometimes at home, looking into his eyes, she searched for things other than the dull pain, other than the acceptance. The staff had been kind and patient with her. Every medical establishment Moni had enco encountered through the National Health Service was full of sympathy and understanding, while all her husband Murtada could say was, we must behave normally, life goes on. He said this when she was still refusing to have sex three whole months after the birth, when she did not want to go back home on holiday. Eventually, they did go to Sudan for Murtada's brother's wedding, but people were so unkind about Adam, so blatantly curious, at turns blaming her, it had to be someone's fault, and pitying her that she was miserable. She began to keep Adam not only indoors, but in her room, away from the prying visitors who seemed to be attracted to him as a grotesque curiosity. Before his birth, Moni had been active, positive, and smiling with her high-powered bank job and independence. Murtada had courted her for years before she succumbed. At first, she had not judged him good enough for her and assumed she could do better. It was his own matter-of-fact awareness of this which caught her attention. His blunt, I know your family is better off than mine. I know that you are socially higher, but I will not take a penny from you because that's not what I want you. That's not why I want you, which roused her admiration. He was a chartered accountant specializing in corporate finance, and they had met when he was securing a loan through her bank. She was impressed and humbled by his dedication to his career and perseverance. His efforts at improving himself touched her. His ambitions for gaining international experience captured her imagination. She wanted a large family, and his instinct to provide won her over. She loved how he described his very first impression of her on the day they met, bus straining against the tailored jacket she was wearing, her hijab tied slick, the ruthless way she questioned his proposal. This truly was how she had been. Then Adam's birth bulldozed her. After the failed visit back home, she stood up to Murtada. I will not take Adam there again. I will not take him to those backward fools. Murtada had replied, these fools are our flesh and blood, but she didn't care. She became one of those women to whom things were clear cut. Everything back there was bad and everything here was good. The more they slept apart, she with Adam and Murtada on his own, the more they disliked each other. Murtada was not comfortable with Adam and she could not forgive him for this. Just the sight of Adam depressed Murtada. He would gaze at him with bewilderment and dismay. Murtada wanted a cure. He wanted state-of-the-art surgery and strong medication. It took him time to accept that nothing could be done. When he did accept this fact, after an inner tussle and genuine agony, he wrote Adam off. He shelved him. We must go on and live our lives as fully as possible, he said to Moni. We must have other children. We must be happy. We cannot let his condition rule us. All this fell to deaf ears. Moni was busy, busier than she had ever been in her life, and more important, you're a good mum, the nurses said. You're doing a brilliant job a job that was hard but encompassing and all-absorbing, rousing all her sincerity and resilience. Looking after Adam, Moni became stronger, father of a disabled son. Murtada became weaker. Before Adam's birth and after his birth, that was her life, split right in the middle. Adam was her first baby and she didn't know what to expect. When he was born, he looked odd and couldn't feed, but she wasn't sure what was wrong. She had no one to compare him with. Then it was one hammer blow after the other, extra days in the hospital, the doctors not sure what was wrong. Denial, clutching at stores, the minute-by-minute minute challenge to cope. A long time or so it felt, 
before the correct diagnosis, the reality check, the sinking in of the truth that Adam was not a healthy, normal baby. She rallied and did her best, ears alert when the doctor spoke, the urgency of it all, the steepest learning curve. Oh yes, getting an MBA had been much easier, standing up to male colleagues at work, a dawdling comparison. All her resources, all her intelligence were needed to be a mother to Adam and not let that role floor her. And in the meantime, she let herself go, weight gain and no time to cut her to toenails to moisturize her elbows or buy deodorant when it ran out. Sleep became a treat, a nap the only gift she wanted. The news on the television screens burnt past her throughout each hectic day and meant nothing. The world could go to hell for all she cared. No one on the whole of planet Earth could possibly be suffering more than her. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you for reading that particular passage because I think it speaks so well to our festival topic, Black Bodies, uh, Grey Matter. Um, and, and, and how perhaps depression is not something that we talk about, but you address it so well in this particular, particular book. I'd like you to respond to that. Yes, I think she, she doesn't know that she's depressed because she's just become, uh, uh, she's suppressed herself. She's no longer a, a person, she's just a carer for this disabled child. And so she's, you know, just completely, uh, you know, put all herself down for, for that. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and so in, 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 in that way, it's almost like how in a week her life changes so drastically. Yeah. And you do the same with a passage of tears where a guy goes to do an investigation and in a week uh, everything changes and changes so dismally. I would like you to talk about that, how one thing, one moment, because this guy is writing diary entries and one moment can change things so dismally and uh, so drastically. Uh, can we talk about a little bit about that? Yes, uh, one of the questions that I was uh, I have in the back of my mind is how life is vulnerable. You know, we, we think that we have life forever, and then for just a twist of a, a, a time, you can lose everything. And and in the confrontation that I have shaped between the two kind of twins, uh, one is in prison and the other came from Quebec, and the one in prison have just he was they were they were brothers, they were twins. They were so similar. They have the same education. But then for some reason, because uh, uh, Jamal, uh, Jibri, the one in, Jamal felt vulnerable at once in his school, uh, in his, uh, uh, how do you say, when he was adolescent. And then everything go, uh, became worse for him because he, 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 he missed, I mean, he, he didn't succeed in his school. Then he was uh, in, uh, socializing with uh, the wrong people and then he became a terrorist and so the fact that he became a terrorist was a way of kind of taking revenge and then he, he's also vulnerable in his powerfulness because he cannot do everything he wants and the fact that his brother just came back uh, was also making his uh, certitude uh, becoming uh, less certain and certain and so I, I, I wanted to, to stage that confrontation and also to yeah to re the question of also confinement and imprisonment and the bodies that have been uh, 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 maltreated was also in, 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 in stage and at least uh, 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 for Jibril, not for Jamal. I mean, because the other guy just came from Canada and just want to be make success life and remain a few days. But even himself will be taken by by the uh, dust and of Djibouti because you cannot leave. One of the questions is that you cannot go back uh, without any uh, thing happening to you. You, you always go, uh, returning, the question of returning is a, is, is a so common uh, question and theme in African literature, but it's always impossible and problematic and at the same time necessary. So how can we deal with something that is nece necessary and at the same time impossible? Absolutely. Um, I wonder whether you'd be willing to read us a little something as a tease. Um, please understand, uh, he said that I should tell you this, Abdul Rahman. Uh, he writes originally in f French, so this is a translation. Um, so, yeah, it's a fantastic translation, by the way, because I love the book. But um, he said I should just do this disclaimer. 
Yeah, you can. You have every right to throw me red potatoes <laughs> and red tomatoes. Uh, my, uh, yeah, you right to pay tribute to uh, David and Ball, uh, Nicole Ball. They are a couple in life, and they are also retired academics, and they also uh, my translator. So it's uh, the very beginning. It began with a uh, with a with a subtitle that is called "Such a Long Absence." I have already been back for three days. I returned to Djibouti for professional reasons, not to feast at the table of nostalgia or reopen old wounds. I'm 29 and I have just signed a contract with a North American company. My remuneration will be substantial. I must, I must hand in a result of my investigation which will not fail to satisfy its gargantuan appetite. A complete file with notes, maps, sketches, and snapshots to be delivered to the Denver office as soon as possible. I have just under a week to wrap up the whole thing. I will, pay, I will be paid in Canadian dollars, transferred to my account based in Montreal, like me. After that, I'm no longer covered by the company. It will be at my own expense, at my own risk, the legal counselor, Ariel Klein, repeated to me, frowning with his one long eyebrow as brushy as Frida Kahlo's. He wished me good luck, turned on his heel, and walked away. I, ha I headed to the airport with my little trapper suitcase. One more page. <laughs> So here I am on assignment in the land of my birth, the land that would not or could not keep me. Grieving is not one of my talents, I admit. I don't like goodbyes or returns. I hate all emotional demonstration. The past interests me less than the future, and my time is precious. It has the color of the green back. In the world I come from, time doesn't stretch out before you into the mist. Time is money, and money makes the world go round. Time is the stock market with its flows of pixels, algorithm, figures, commodities, manufactured goods, rating indexes, ideas, sounds, images, or simulation models that pop up on screens the world over. It's the life, of, it's the life force of the universe. It's about killing the competition and grabbing the coveted market. Thank you. There's something uh, somewhat cold about Jabril as, as, as a person. It's like he's in this pursuit of, of, of money and doesn't really open himself up emotionally to anything, uh, which is something similar with Iman as well, with her beauty and whatever. She's very distant and uh, is almost like in any relationship for what she can kind of get out of it. I'd like you to talk about this character building of these two particular characters, Jibril and Iman. Yeah, but basically, you know, when you write, uh, the whole uh, issue is also a language issue. So uh, one of way I came to uh, deal with this confrontational uh, 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 construction is that, as you say rightfully, uh, Jamal, the one who is in prison is hiding, uh, the Jibril, the one who is from Canada, the returnee, is hiding between the managerial language. And he was talking about stock change and manufacturers. And, uh, I'm not here for uh, emotional, I'm just doing my work, you know. And he's speaking the language of, you know, uh, 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 successful business maker. And, 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 and so it's just, you know, a way of showing his vulnerability and protecting himself and making a kind of you know, protection belt. And on the, on the other side, uh, the threatening one is using the language of Quran and just you know menacing because he was using certain particular verses in which you have you know the threat and you know if you don't do this you will pay for that and you will pay forever because you have the jena etc. Et so this confrontation between those two types of languages was a way of bringing and uh, and making this confrontation at least worth uh, how do you say believable in the scope of a novel. 
and, and, and I believe also it's, uh, the whole world is also a question of language, you know? The ways we which language shape the, the world and, and somehow ultimately also put us in a position in which we, we have created somehow, you know? It's, it's kind of dialectical different, because something, language creates reality and reality in, encapsulate you and so on and so forth. Yes. <laughs> This is actually the only event I ever did where I managed to speak about the three women. <laughs> so good. <laughs> okay. So this is the youngest one. She's in her she's in her twenties. She's the um, the Syrian um, refugee. She's already married, been married three times, and um, she's very beautiful. And as she was growing up, she was told that you know oh, you're so beautiful, and this beauty will lead you to have a good marriage, and you will be have a comfortable life, and all that. So a lot of and, but this didn't work out because you know she uh, she lost her husband and she married another one who was violent and then she got divorced and then she married a third one who was a, a you know a careless uh, person so it's it's not working for her and she's not able I mean part of her struggle is that she's trying to uh, be someone beyond this beauty so that she's not only uh, you know, the physical beautiful. She's trying to find uh, a personality within her, a kind of a strength inside her. And because she's young and because she, her life has been um, more or less, you know, a kind of religiously sort of sanctified uh, prostitution in a way. She's moving from one husband to the other. She still hasn't developed herself. She hasn't found herself. So this is part of what happens to her in this uh, journey. Yeah. Um. There's, there's another thing that your two books do, uh, which is uh, the via on the mythical, you know, with, uh, with, with you with the bird and stuff, and with you, uh, the via on the mythical, when, when, you, you, when, 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 when uh, Jamal is in prison and he's saying certain things, and it's, sometimes it's like, is this actually happening or is it not? Is it actually, and it's, and, and it's beautiful and lyrical and um, what led you to use that as a writing style, for instance, and, and, and you also, uh, The only fact that Jamal is in prison uh, allows him, you know, to go beyond his mind and he was, he, uh, in his, uh, let's say, bad days, he's just using Quran to uh, threat in the people. But in his good days, he can, you know, he can uh, look closely uh, to the uh, surroundings and see, for example, ants and small insects and so on and so forth. You know, one, one of the, when I was uh, re writing that part, I was also uh, uh, thinking about uh, Wale Shainka, the man died, you know, when, when Wale Shainka was years back in prison. And in prison, you have your mind, is, maybe your body is not free, but your mind is free actually. And you can, you can pay attention to something that you don't normally pay attention to because you're just seeing, you know, ants and, and small insects. And, and so this is, was becoming kind of metaphor of the world and the construction, the ways in which ants and bees and construct something. And he has this kind of, you know, eye for the world, and and at the same time, it's just a challenging. I say, you put me in prison, but I, I'm not weaker than that. You know, I'm even stronger than that, and I can trade into you, and you will pay for something. And he's just have this kind of, you know, uh, aggressive mood because otherwise he will die. You know, if he if, if he if he surround. He has to be aggressive, and he has to be thinking, and he has to be imagining. So he's using his creative mind for, time, for so good reasons or bad reasons, but he has to do that because otherwise he will die in prison. Yeah, because in, 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 uh, with my novel, the women have kind of left the city and they've gone to the wilderness. Uh, into the wilderness. So I wanted that in a way to be symbolic of of, uh, of having the city represent formal religion, you know, uh, established religion, and then um, the, the movement to the highlands, uh, to the wilderness, representing a more kind of spiritual way. Of, of, of looking at, at that, uh, their faith, instead of looking at it in terms of organized uh, religion. So that's where the, the, the storytelling and the, you know, the, the, these oh, um, sort of Sufi tales come in, Rumi's Sufi tales come in into the story. And it's, it's kind of weaved with this uh, mystical talking bird who's telling these stories to, to Iman. And at the same time, bringing in also, you know, uh, things like the Pilgrim's Progress, which is a Christian uh, uh, tale. 
and uh, some of uh, George MacDonald, uh, he's not very well known, he's actually a Scottish person from Aberdeenshire, but he's the one who influenced um, C.S. Lewis. So if you read his books, he, he's, he writes about the, you know the white witch that, that was in the, the, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It, she kind of comes from the George MacDonald. So there's a lot of folk tales and things that, that come from this area of, of, of Scotland that I didn't use in, in my work. And they, they have a, a, a kind of strong basis in, in Christianity. So I wanted to show kind of the link between Islam and, and, and Christianity and the, 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 the kind of different uh, things that they could bring together, yeah. So, as we continue, I would actually like to ask you as well, uh, because your book is translated and uh, we'd like more of your books translated. What do you feel is um, the role of translation in bridging borders across the continent and letting us have a more, you know, talk to each other and get to know what's... Translation is crucial, you know. Uh, I believe even that uh, in, if you don't have translator, you could not have. You know, I, I teach in the U.S. and sometimes I, I I I challenge my my what I call my students. Sometimes I call even affectionately my kids. You know, and some of those kids believe that in, I don't know in Goethe was writing in English or uh, Sartre was writing in English and everything was done in their own language. And say, come on kids, you know, you know don't believe that the Hollywood and, you know, and, and language, uh, an English language is the beginning of everything. We, have, we used to have, and we still have millions of languages and thousands of, you know, and if you don't have translator, you cannot read, uh, and, and we now assume that, uh, I don't know, uh, Farik Attar was, was writing in, in English, and uh, Rumi was writing in English, and so this, this perception is, has to be uh, uh, put aside. And, and we believe that translation is not only the, the translation of languages, it's also translation of ideas and modalities. And without translation, there is no world. And we, I, I don't have to go back to the myth of Babel, but without translation, we don't do anything. I believe uh, that translation is the place of, uh, of change. It's the place of democracy. It's the place of, of, of uh, common existence. It's the place of our diversity. Without translation, we are lost, because each and every one will stuck to his, uh, let's say, icons and totems and say, mine are bigger than yours. <laughs> and so then, you know, we don't have to be to, to the neoliberal period. So translation is Africa also, because we would have to, I, I like, you know, this uh, program that they have, Gugi uh, in, in, in because I, I'm telling to you because you live in Kenya, and, and the fact that you have this price in Kiswahili, and I'm a good friend to Gugi, so I met many times, so Gugi believes that the African language is translation, so I will second him. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to open up to the audience, if anybody wants to ask these two amazing, brilliant minds, these wonderful black bodies with a lot of gray matter. <laughs> Would you like to ask anything? Yes. Hi. Um, in mentioning the last character you talked about just now, you, you mentioned a phrase which caught me. You said moral prostitution. Um, in the sense, I guess, of her marrying and marrying again to, to keep herself together but never finding herself. And I'm wondering if you can speak to that in the context of the world we live in and the ways women... Uh, I'm trying to phrase this correctly. <laughs> the ways women twist themselves into doing things that are society to be accepted, mm. which they don't want to do, which is still prostitution, whilst frowning on those who are in prostitution. Yeah, yeah. I use the, the term religiously sanc sanc sanctified. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like really, yeah that's, religiously that's, that's, uh, approved uh, uh, pr pr prostitution, whereas this, this woman goes from one marriage, it is a marriage, but she's uh, you know, it is a marriage, between quotes, uh, that has this stamp of approval, but she's kind of like going from it, from one to, 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 to the other, and she herself is, uh, 
you know, kind of like confused as to what what is uh, what is uh, going on. But but in a way, she's been brought up to believe that this is her only way to to earn a living. There's no other value that she has, you know. And uh, um, you know, this is the, the the sad thing that she's. Uh, um, uh, you know she's she's in this kind of transaction going backwards and forth and, and and you know agreed upon there is agreement it's not it's not non consensual it, i mean she's she's in agreement with it but something about it gives her this feeling of humiliation you know what is it that she's feeling there's something wrong that she's feeling humiliated by this uh, this this arrangement you know and uh, it's not a proper, it's not a real, it's not a real marriage to her. You know, she feels that it's temporary, that, that she can be dropped any time and, you know, she can be discarded, she can be replaced, she can be, you know, this, this kind of feeling goes on, on and on for her. And uh, the, 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 the contradiction is that she is beautiful and so, you know, that maybe if she wasn't beautiful, she would have from the beginning been, you know, told that you need to work hard, you need you might not find a husband, you need to work hard and and and, and, and that in that direction, yeah. So <laughs> uh, any other question? Are you all sure there are no questions? Yes. Sorry. I have a question about I have a question about translation. Um, when you read your, the piece from your book, did you feel it the same way as when you actually wrote it? Uh, thank you. I wouldn't know because I was kind of uh, uh, nervous to read in, in, in English because I don't write normally in English. I, I can talk in English, but. But I'm also a nervous guy, so I, 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 it will take me, as I say often time, to inhabit the English language, which is not mine normally. It will take some time, you know. And I, I didn't have the lullabies in my, in my, back in my mind when I was a kid. But that is the way it is. You know, French is not also my first language. My first language is Somali. And French I learned at the, at the age of seven at the school. So, but I, I have taken time to conquest it. So I can, now I feel home in French, I inhabit French, but I still don't inhabit English in a, in a sensitive way. I have an intellectual uh, relationship with English. So that's why I don't feel the same thing, right? I, I, I'm more nervous when I'm writing in English. But that is okay, you know, because we just have to write in one language and then translation will do the job. This is the way they were doing, you know? Uh, again, Sartre and, and, and I don't know, or, or, or Goethe was not writing in many languages, they just write in their own language. And then you have some, another admirable mind, that is the translator, who transmute the emotion, the language of one writer to another language. Could I just ask you, do you work with your French, do you work with him? Yeah, I, I actually, I, I'm lucky because they are a couple, you know, David and Nicole, and David is American born, he's a Brooklyn guy, and Nicole, she's a French, but they are both married for 15 or 17 years now, they are retired, and so they often have a discussion, lively discussion, and they call me and say, Abdu, Nicole is saying this, and uh, David is saying, thinking that, what do you think? <laughs> and, you know, it's the luck that I have actually a couple translator. I, I say I have the two instead of one normally, you know? but uh, 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 they consult me sometimes, but they also do their thing, you know, and that is okay, you know. I don't want to be the nagging writer who just say, you know, yeah, yeah. But, but I have this relationship that is very, very uh, uh, unique also. And, and, and you've, been, you've been translated as well. Uh, what has that relationship been like with your translator? Yeah, so with Arabic, it's the only language uh, that I, of course, my first language is the only other language I know. So I work very closely with the Arabic translators, and I read the drafts, and I go over it, and, you know, and so there's many, many mistakes that can be made. Have you ever been really angry with a translator when they did? 
Well, I mean, uh, <laughs> anger is not a solution. I have to just, uh, you know, tell them this is a, you misunderstood me. Most of the, the the problems come from a misunderstanding of the of the English. So he's then used a word in uh, in Arabic which is not the uh, what my intention was, and so you know I I, I clarify it uh, for for them, yeah. So, uh, but with other languages, way of, <laughs> of really knowing. So um, you spoke about your, I'm sorry, I, I keep going back to the translation because I always find it quite fascinating. So if um, a person who is um, a technical translator of a language um, does not have that lived experience of, um, or be like, somebody sitting in Brooklyn um, translating um, a story that is in Djibouti, um, is it going to be just a technical translation, is there not like nuances that are lost? Are there, is there imagery that is just technical? I, I, I personally think technical translation is actually quite dangerous because it should be an artistic translation uh, because the work of translation is an art form on its own, isn't it? Uh, at least with the stuff that I've had to translate personally. It's, it's obvious, you know, as I said, they are retired academics, so they don't, they don't need money, you know, they're just doing for the, uh, the love of labor. And David himself is a poet, so, so he's, we are in the realm of, of, of uh, creativity. I, I never have any experience with a, with a technical translator translating my stuff. Sometimes it's even difficult in French. So. So we are not talking here about technical translation. We are, we, I just have the experience of having creative uh, uh, writers and poets translating to creative writers and poets. Any, any other questions from anybody? OK. Uh, would you like to read a little something else before we finish off? Yeah. And I'm only asking this because it's a really fantastic book. They're both very fantastic books. And you need to get them. Um, they're not that expensive. They're not expensive at all, in fact. And the writers are fantastic. And you might not see them again. So, yeah. You, today you have a chance to get your book signed by both of them. So you have like, do three minutes and then we'll watch your call it. Okay. Okay, this is the character Iman, the young uh, character. And this is the first uh, time she gets uh, visited by the hoop hoopoo bird. Okay. Uh, later, lying in her narrow bed underneath the open window, Iman could see the night sky. It would never be completely dark. They were too far north for that. Instead, pink twilight glowed over the western horizon. There were clouds that looked round and full like candy floss and ones that were as flat as milk stains. Low streaks of light touched the ground as if there would never be a deep dark night. In the east there was a crescent, low orange and perfect. The stars were distant, much more distant than she could remember seeing before. Back home, her family slept outdoors in the summer and indoors in the winter. The desert gave them scorching heat and bitter cold. Hers were hardy people, able to adjust and pickle and organize. But it was not memories of home that Iman embraced, not memories of walks along the Euphrates or vendors selling grilled corn. Instead, her ears caught the sound of wings, a rustle of movement, sounds that were at first gentle but then became distinct. Through the window, a shy creature hesitated, asked permission to come in and speak to her. I am dreaming, she thought. I am dreaming, and this is a good dream. 
The creature was a bird, but it belonged to the night. The creature could be a bat, but it had feathers. It spoke a language that she could understand. It knew her from long ago. It had traveled with her all those miles, never left her side, was always there, but only here in this special place could it make itself known. Yet it was not entirely visible, not exactly, for when she looked at it directly, it disappeared. She had to pretend she was looking in another direction or at something else for the orange, black, and white to materialize again. But this was not a problem. Iman wanted to listen to it and talk to it more than she wanted to look at it. The creature had a name, Hoopi, it said, named after the bird in the Quran. You are too big for a Hoopi, said Iman. You are fat. She was not afraid to tease it. He said, you are bigger than me, but I know more. I can find hidden sources of water. You are stronger, but I have flown further. I have seen east and west, north and south, in human creatures that trail purple clouds, remote forests, trapped people, animals as big as giants, humans as small as plants. I've seen surplus building and tearing down. At times I've seen nothing because in some places there was nothing, nothing alive. But all things submit to the rule of time. We can't stop it moving. It pulls us forward. It takes us away. There is no escape. I am here to warn you. Do not stay here in this cottage at this loch for so long. Oh, I love it here, she said. A room all to myself and the cupboard full of clothes. I don't want to leave. This is not a destination, but a stage, he said. The stage of consequence, where what you do and what you want and what you secretly think will take a tangible shape. Things you will see and experience. Leave before this happens, continue. We are going, she said, to visit Lady Evelyn's grave, the three of us. Only one of you will get there, the hoopy said. The one who is least distracted. The one who has learned that to keep going, it's best not to look right or left. This confused her, and she started asking why, how come, how did he know? When she got no reply, she wanted to know which one of them it would be, Moni, Salma herself, which one of them would visit that difficult-to-reach place. Say Iman, she begged. Instead, the Hoopi told her a story. Uh, an oft-quoted uh, quote from... Uh, by people who don't read a lot in East Africa is that East Africa is a literary desert. These two writers are proof that this is not true. Thank you very much for being in our audience. Please buy the books. They will, the books are outside for sale. Um, a Passage of Tears and uh, Bird Sermons. Their signatures are free. Thank you very much.